I only do this because it's the only way I ever get to visit the Tad Williams. <laughs> Other people might see that as a reason to be out of town. But... <laughs> Okay, um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I am as excited as you are because besides being a wonderful person, which he is, as you will discover if you don't already know him, uh, Peter has always been one of my favorite writers. I won't do the horrible thing to him that people have started doing to me, which is say how old I was when I started reading his work. <laughs> because for those of us veteran writers who've been around for a while, that's just uh, a little bit painful. <laughs> However, I will say that um, I have never read anything of Peter's that has not delighted me, and that uh, he's <coughs> written, besides some very well-known things, he's written a lot of other works of, of amazing quality that you may not know about. So if this is your first chance to run into Peter's work, don't stop just with the new book, good as it is. Go out and find some other stuff, too. So that was my starter. So, Peter, hello, and welcome to Kepler's. Tad, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, partly to see you, and partly because Kepler's was the first bookstore I ever wandered into when I came to California for the first time in 1960, 61. I was, at a, I was a part of the, the creative writing program at Stanford, still fairly new then. I was in the class, God help me, with people like Barry McMurtry, Ken Kesey, Gurney Norman, Joanna Ostro, Judy Rasco. It's terrifying. <laughs> and that was the year when, really, when my ego got pounded to dust. <laughs> I wrote a novel during that time, which nobody will ever see. I wrote one short story, just one short story, that eventually became an opera. Should be a total loss. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there was Kepler's. I spent a lot of time here at one time or another bopping around on a motor scooter back then, and, and walking in here now, for all that Kepler's has changed, the area has changed, I still recognize the smell. <laughs> That'd be Kepler's, and I'm thrilled to be here now. It's always been a great store and a, and a heart of the community. I, I grew up in this area, um, and uh, you know Kepler's has been um, the, the center place for books south of San Francisco for a very long time. Now, speaking of, okay, you came to Stanford, but what, where along the way did you first start thinking, maybe writing is what I want to do? Because it's oftentimes a very weird journey for people. In my case, it was, the weirdness was the straight line. Because I was writing before I could write. I was making up stories about Tarzan, the Lone Ranger, God knows what else, and getting my mother to write them down. <laughs> Except for, well, two things. One that was fairly obvious, that I was small and right-handed, and I was never going to play first base for the New York Yankees. <laughs> there was that, and the other was simply, if I were, to this day, ever offered a choice between being the kind of writer I am and a great jazz guitarist, I don't know. <laughs> if the devil ever offered me that one, I'd have to ask for the prayers of the congregation to get me out of this. <laughs> But apart from that, there was never anything else I wanted. I loved stories. I loved being told stories. I loved being read to. I loved reading as I discovered it. And to this day, barring the obvious, it's the most sen sensual thing I know. <laughs> well, OK, so here's, this is a question. And I, I, I ran into this on the internet, which, as we all know, is a repository of truth and nothing but. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I, I did see a reference to that one of the seminal works for you was Wind in the Willows. Yes. Is that true? Ah, it was for me too. Please talk about that a little bit. I had a wonderful teacher for two years, second and third grades. Her name was Margaret Butterwick, Ma Maggie Butterwick. She was tall, skinny, Irish, and she loved literature. She loved stories and poetry. And Maggie sort of understood me Really early on, she told my parents not to worry about my grades, not to worry about my lack of sociability, not to worry about the fact that I sat in the back of her class. Whatever else the class was doing, I was writing poetry, stories. She, she sheltered me. I knew Maggie loved me. I loved her. And when I was eight or nine, I was sickly as a boy, and I had a lot of 
respiratory problems. And Maggie sent me home a book called The Wind in the Willows. I don't know that that was the, the book that made me a writer. I just know that I wanted to do that. That was it. And I think the proudest moment I have ever had in my somewhat checkered literary career was walking over to Maggie's house. She only lived a couple of blocks away. And I'd walk there for co cookies and coffee <laughs> and giving her a copy of my first book. I think that was it. And I even inscribed it um, to her. And because she loved Irish literature, and so do I, I inscribed a poem by the great blind bard, Raftery. Um, David Raftery, translated by James Stevens, one of my seminal writers who made a difference in my life. And Stevens had translated it as, the, it was the answer, Raftery had apparently improvised as a song to the man who saw him fiddling in the down, earth, down to earth pub and asked, who's, who's the musician? And Raftery's answer is, I am Raftery the poet, full of hope and love, my eyes without sight, my mind without torment, going west of my journey to, by the light of my heart, tired and lonely to the end of the road. Behold me now with my back to a wall, playing music to empty pockets. I quoted that out to, to Maggie. That's excellent. I'm even more impressed that you can remember it. I, I have trouble with my own zip code. You know. I, can't, I can't remember what I ate for breakfast or what I, where I left what. But for what it's worth, poems and songs, even totally useless songs, I remember. I'm not sure there is such a thing as a totally useless song. I, um, one of the things, and I don't know if this was true for you, the, and it may actually, later on I wanted to talk a little bit about where we incline as writers and for what reasons, but one of the things that really caught me when I was a kid about The Wind in the Willows uh, was that it was the idea that there were worlds under our noses, that there were things going on, just in this case, it was, you know, the river bank or under the river bank or, you know, the wild wood. The wild wood. But it was the idea that there were entire worlds of heroism and terror and adventure and excitement and, yes, buttered toast. That, that was very big for me when I was young. But that were going on right just out of our line of sight. And I think that always was, I think that was one of the things that led me into fantasy fiction mm -hmm. as a preferred thing to read. It's the same thing with me in the sense that what I do, there's a reason that the book is called, um, whichever book it is, this book, story collection, um, I don't like the title. The Line Between? The Line Between. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because for me, the line between fantasy and what we describe as reality is a very thin one, sometimes evanescent. And for me, fantasy has always been that thing that's just beyond the corner of your eye. It's the thing you almost see if you turn, if you turn too fast, you lose it. If you turn slowly, you might get a glimpse. It's not an accident, I think, that my best, best friend in California, whom I meet, um, usually once a week, for a beer and a half each, and talk about any damn thing we want to talk about. His name is Mr. Badger. <laughs> I'm sure there's a connection. Yeah, I would think so. Is he actually a badger? No, although there's, there's a certain, certain, no, I won't even say resemblance. <laughs> not that. It's not that, but um, it does tend to, win, to wear t shirts. Um, celebrating the Wisconsin Badgers. Ah, that might have okay. something to do with it. All right. I, actually, this does sound like the beginning of, of one of your stories, so there, that might very well be something we'll have to get back to later on. Um, first of all, one of the things that we're doing tonight is we are celebrating Peter's new book, uh, Summer Long, which I have read and uh, I enjoyed it very, very much, and I will have more things to, to say about it later on as we talk about it and ask questions. Um, well, what I would like to do first, if he doesn't mind, is to um, have Peter read just a short section um, from the book with maybe a little, this is, this is Abe talking, yeah. and if you want me to set it up, or do you want to set no, it up? I think I can do that. Abe okay. is a retired history oh, yeah, it's your part, so. recently retired, so jumpy with it living on an island about six miles off Seattle, such as I lived once, 
what what they've done once. He had a long-standing relationship with a, a flight attendant named Joanna. Um, it had been an item for well over 20 years. They never married, but they're always together one way or another. And they spent weekends on his island where he comes into C Seattle. We're up just a little bit. Right. And, um, and they have taken in into his garage a woman they can't explain exactly. They don't know why they took her in. She's a waitress at a local restaurant that they love to go to. She's new. Her name is Lioness Lazos. L Lazos. More or less Greek, although they're never sure. But there is something about Lioness that makes them comfortable in her company. And the issue of, of Abe being 66 and on, you know, spending time on an island with a much younger woman just is somehow not an issue. Joanna trusts her, trusts him, and can't say why she does, she just does. And at one point, Lioness and Abe are actually having lunch together you know, on, on his little sliver of beach. I had one of those little racky. We gotta keep the mic out because it's. Little ra rocky, ratty sliver. Can you, I, where you, you can hold it for clams. Him? And the clams have a perfect right to move when you're done. They do. <laughs> um. Yeah. Joanna herself says of, of her daughter, Lily, who's gay and worries the hell out of her because she has a terrible system terrible taste in the women. <laughs> uh, Joanna was laughing herself now. None of the above, although I do have my favorite. The fact is that I trust the girl with you the same way I trust her to treat Lily kindly. And I don't know why. I don't know a thing about her, but that, Abe, you come right down to it. But there it is. Yeah, I don't know anything either. It was not entirely true by then. Lioness always brought her own meals and ate them at work, only coming to the house on occasion for a glass of water or to use the bathroom. She never disturbed him when he was writing, except to ask if he and Joanna would mind her weather stripping a window, or whether something that looked like garbage really was garbage. On his part, Abe made a conscious point of keeping their conversations brief, and of never looking down when they spoke together. The primavera face had nothing to do with it, nor did the way in which she flung back the Sahara air when she turned on her knees to smile at him as he passed the garage where she was scouring and scraping and deodorizing. It's the air, he explains to Joanna, three quarters of choking. It's something that happens to the air around her. Like when you're looking across a hot stove or a steam radiator, and the air seems to be rippling, distorting things just in that one place. With her, I think the molecules turn sideways or get on edge or something. They start dancing, boogieing, rubbing up against each other. They get all sorts of warm and sweaty, and the air just changes. Probably accounts for the weird weather. The day that Lioness invited him to share a Japanese bento box lunch was an unseasonably mild one. Clear enough that Seattle seemed closer than it was, and they could make out sandpipers scurrying along the lee shore of Bainbridge Island. Abe comment, commented on it as they sat outside in his ancient lawn chairs, eating sushi and daikon radish. This is not right. I love it, but it's simply not right, and I know we're going to have to pay for it. The Pacific Northwest is very Calvinist. <laughs> Lioness chuckled into her salmon roll without, respond, without replying. Abe expanded. See, pleasure is ends in retribution, always. We're overcharged for happiness, and we deserve to be. There'll be an earthquake. We get them, you know. Maybe a flu epidemic. Maybe a storm down from Canada, Alaska. You'll see. Calvin's God always balances the books. <laughs> oh, I don't like that, Lioness said. She sounded like a child. No, that isn't right. That isn't the way things go together. Pleasure is the one thing the gods don't charge for. They can't, they love it too much themselves. She stopped, peering at him almost slyly, as though she were pretending to be a spy. The look was so comical, so foreign to her naturally candid expression, that it was almost all he could manage, it was all he could manage not to laugh. She said, the sushi is good, isn't it? I just love sushi. You get it at the place where, by the ferry terminal? She nodded. Abe said, try to time, time it from when Wakatsu to Wakats. Waktsuki's in the kitchen. This is okay, but Waktsuki's an artist. Lily, Lioness had turned away, 
and was glide, gazing out over the water, seemingly watching a pair of kayakers gliding close to the Blackberry shore. One paddler was a man, the other a woman. They kept their crafts as close together as courting birds. Abe said, gods, that's plural. When she did not respond, he went on, good, I like that. My folks, got, my folks got stuck with that one desert psychopath and wished him and everybody else. Him and his loony cousin, Allah. No court of appeals, no plea bargaining, nothing but tantrums and boasting and endless demands for love. I always envy the Catholics. At least they have saints to pray to, they have the Virgin. Forget monotheism, humans are too much for one measly God. We need pantheons, we need a million gods, like the Hindus, I'm telling you, we need bloody mobs of gods. Lioness did not take her eyes from the two kayakers as she brushed away a few grains of rice and abruptly stood up. You wouldn't like them. They walked the streets talking to themselves. They smell bad. She started back toward the garage and Abe ambled carefully after her. Now, just that little section there pointed up one of the things that, uh, that I really enjoy about the book, um, which is there are basically five major characters who are people, but there's a sixth character, and, and that is Puget Sound and the island itself and the Pacific Northwest in general. And it was very obvious that there was, in, in, at some level, that it was a labor of love that you were either had been there recently or had been there at a very important time, that you had really lived in that landscape and that it, it meant something to you and it really came through in the book. Um, tell me a little bit about that and what it meant to you. I lived on Bainbridge Island for well, one, one year in Seattle on Queen Anne Hill and five, five on Bainbridge Island. I have to tell you something that's very odd after what Tad said, which is that physical description and atmosphere comes very hard to me. I don't think I'm terribly observant. I'm good with dialogue. I'm good with characterization. I think about the way people talk. I listen. It's the one I'm listening to music. But I'm amazed that the re reviews so far, like, like Tad, have spoken about my, my awareness of the island and the Northwest as a real place. Because I work very hard on those, and I never think I get them right. Um, one of my masters, if you will, Ursula Le Guin, has it the other way around. Ursula loves just creating and describing a world, a landscape, you know, a culture, and says, which I doubt, but she insists that she has trouble with characterization and dialogue. I can't really believe it, but I do know that, as I say, I never think I'm as observant as I should be. And I'm impressed that everybody seems to think that I've made a character out of this landscape. Maybe, finally, at my age, I'm beginning to get it right. <laughs> Could be. Well, it's, but it's also, part of it is because the way that the book is designed, and I'm going to... Again, I'm hoping a lot of you are going to be reading the book after tonight if you haven't read it yet, and so I don't want to give too many things away. So I'm going to be walking a bit of a fine line here on plot details, but I don't think it's giving anything away to say that these characters are going through a fairly momentous time, that things are happening that are important to them, um, and they are things that ripple out into the world of nature. So the fact that we are so firmly sunken in the reality of that Pacific Northwest climate and vegetation and all that, really for me was, um, it was almost, like I said, it was almost like another character's emotional life being laid out, except that because it's nature, because it's oblique to us, it was a character that you're not really knowing exactly what they're thinking, but you're seeing how they respond. And in that sense, I thought it worked extremely well. Um, have you have you come across this in the pen? You said you said this is something you don't think you're good at. Is this something you you feel and you struggled with in some of your other work, or just that you 